Welcome to our online worship experience. I'm Renee, I'm on staff at Manor Church, and I'm gonna be your host today. In a moment, we're gonna sing a few songs and worship together. Jefferson's gonna continue the faith series for us. And you know what, it's February. There are so many things going on. We're gonna take communion at the end of service today. Also, it's game day. The big game is going on today. Go Chiefs, right? And guess what? It's also Black History Month, which is the most important thing of all. And we just wanted to make sure you know that we believe that Black history is American history. So I'm gonna challenge you today as I challenge myself. Let's read a couple of books. Let's listen to some podcasts. Let's stretch ourselves and even listen to some things or read some things that don't line up with what we actually believe because I believe that that is when our faith really grows. Here at Manor Church, we really believe that it is our mission to glorify God by equipping His people to change their worlds. And if you wanna connect with us, you can do that in three ways. Number one, continue to watch Engage with us online. Number two, join a small group. There are some really great groups going on and you can check them all out on our website. And number three, if you feel comfortable, join us on Sunday mornings on our campus at 11 a.m. for in-person service. Remember, please wear your mask and also if anyone in your home is not feeling well, just stay home and engage with us online. As always, we wanna take one quick moment to thank you so much for your generosity. Remember, you can continue to give online, whether it be a one-time gift or if you wanna partner with us and help us continue to do the work of the ministry. Either way, we're so grateful for your support and we just wanted to say thank you. So we are so excited for today's online worship experience. And as always, our prayer is that you encounter the person of God right where you are and you have seeds that, that are planted that will take root and make positive changes in your life. So get ready, because church starts right now. I am 
not forsaken. I am who you see I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you see I am. I am choosing, not forsaken. I am who you see I am.
Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited about today. If we haven't had the chance of meeting, my name is Jefferson and I'm on staff here. And today we're in the second week of a series we're simply calling Faith. And I think it's going to be really impactful. But before we get started, I just want to let you know uh, a few things about who I am, you know, where I come from. I just got married at the end of September to a beautiful human being. Her name is Kayla, and we finally got her name changed. Like her last, her her real official name is Kayla Bullock. It is really fun to say, and it's all legal, which is really good. Another thing that we have is rats. Yeah, we we have rats, and I know you're thinking, Jefferson, that's an interesting fun fact to tell us. Um, but why? Eh, I'll tell you why. A few weeks ago, I was preaching a message, and at the end of the message, I went down uh, through a list of things that had happened since Kayla and I had gotten married. Kind of a series of unfortunate events, some might call it. Others might call it spiritual warfare. And it ended with this great celebration, a, a, a really a fabulous testimony of us catching Remy the rat. See, we had had a rat problem and we got a trap. I put the edge, uh, a corner piece of a Pop-Tart in there, um, and I came home from a little trip, and Remy was dead, and I, I shared that with you, and we celebrated, and it was really good. You know, the, the freedom that we felt in our souls was so good. It's like, we, we don't have the rat anymore. We are free. Uh, there is no more oppression. No more rats, no more rats. But I think you know where this is going. And if you're not young and dumb like me, you probably know this hard reality that it's never just rat. You never just have a rat issue, but it really is a rat's issue. It is multiple of them. We had been FaceTiming um, some friends who live out west and uh, we just finished dinner. We're, we're, we're cleaning up, washing the dishes, and we, we hear what sounds like a small cat maybe in our walls and we just have to come to the grips of reality that it is more rats so we're we're gearing up again for this issue a, a crew of rats maybe um maybe i like to call them a gang of rats have apparently stored themselves in our attic and 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 here's the here's the real troubling thing is that kayla and i are the ones paying rent you know, I'm, I might feel different if they were contributing just a little bit, but no, they're, they're demolishing our house. It's very invasive, and I'm going on and on and on about the rats because it's really important and it's really affecting my life right now. So I'm going to tell you where we're at in the process. Contacted our property manager, and, and an exterminator came out, right? Um, shouts out to the pest guys. They came and they say, here are some entry points and here are some extra traps. So we're like, yes, we're feeling good. But it sounds like these rats are building a little city in our attic. I, I like to think that the rats come into the living room and they get out a little notepad and they're, they're making a blueprint of our house and they're recreating a miniature version of the layout of our house in the attic. It's just, it's just I'm trying to add some humor in my life. So 
right? Inspector comes out. We, we get the property manager to, to get some maintenance orders going. We fix the holes and we're starting out using this stuff called the great stuff. You, you've probably used it. It's like a little foam. It comes out and then it expands. So you put in little cracks, put in little holes because we're trying to seal up all the entry points. But after the first round, we are like, well, there's some more entry points. There's some more holes here. There's some more holes outside. What about underneath the crawl space? So we have an inspector come out again, and then we have more maintenance requests, and we're feeling safe. But then it's like, wait, there are more entry points. I need more great stuff to fill up the cracks. And, I, and honestly, I'm just wondering, I can't fill every hole. Like, this house is so old, the foundation is like, it's, it's a little scary sometimes to think about, but I don't think we can fill up every single hole in this house. The guy's going underneath, he's sending me pictures. I'm like, that's what the underneath of our house looks like, what? And I'm texting with Kayla. She's at work and I just text, ha, baby, how are you doing? I know some of you hate calling each other baby. Me usually go with babe, um, not that that's important. But I say, how are you doing? She says, I'm at the end of my rope. I, 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 I'm at the end of my rope. I, I, I have nothing left to give. I have no more energy. I'm honestly just so frustrated and sick and tired of this rat issue. I don't know what to do. I, I'm ready to move. I'm ready to burn down the house, live in a tent. Let's, you know, rats can still get in your tent. But you, you understand what I'm saying. I'm at the end of my rope. And maybe today that is how you feel. You just feel like you're at the end of your rope. You got through 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's, it's February now, 2021. But we're, we still feel the residue of last year. And 21 days of prayer and fasting maybe didn't, do what you thought it was going to do, and you're just tired. At the end of your rope, no more energy of trying. You're showing up to your job. You're, maybe you're showing up to your living room if you're still working from home, and you're just like, does this matter? You're watching church online. You're like, I'm tired of watching church online. I want to be in person. COVID, go away. You're like, does it even matter anymore? I'm at the end of my rope. Might I submit this to you today. Maybe you feel like you're at the end of your rope because you can't fill the cracks that are in your foundation by filling it with the great stuff. Like you have some issues in your life, you have some, some holes, some gaps, and you've been trying to fix it, you've been trying to cover it up, and you're using the great stuff, but it's just, it's not working like you thought it was going to. You're, you're working really hard to fix every hole, to fix the foundation, but you can't make it happen by your own strength. And you're searching for peace, but you can't find peace anywhere. It's because you got rats all up in your house. They've got into your attic right there. They're in your brain. The, the thoughts that you have in your life are preventing you from moving forward, from having that peace. And every time you fix a hole, another rat gets in, and, and it just reminds you you're not the father that you think you are. And you have rats saying that you're an unloving mother. And you have rats speaking to you in your life saying that you will never pass this class in school. Like you, you're never going to amount to anything. You have rats in your life saying you'll be alone forever. You have rats in your life saying that the, your past mistakes, you can't ever get past it. Your future is bleak. Don't even try anymore. You have the end of your rope. That's what the rats are saying, and you have no peace. But, 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 hey, granted, you tried, right? Like, you were trying, you started out with the good stuff first, 
Before, it was great, before you moved to the great stuff, you tried the good stuff. And you're like, hey, maybe a night out partying with my friends and getting drunk. That'll be fun. But it's only temporary. Like the, the great stuff is the good stuff because the, rat, the rats can eventually chew through it. Like night out partying sounds fun until that moment of validation leaves. Oh, hey, I'm just going to have sex this one time with this person that I don't really know. We're not dating. We're definitely not married. But if for a moment, I didn't feel alone. Good stuff that's trying to like fill in your life. But then, but then you're like, okay, I get that's wrong. I shouldn't be doing that. I'm going to move on to the great stuff. So I'm going to watch church once a month until it wears off. But you only, go, you only watch church once a month because you feel like that's the closest that you can actually get to God. You're like, hey, maybe I'll, maybe I'll even join a small group this semester. That'll give me the facade of being in community without actually after being transparent and telling people what's going on in my life. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, 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 uh, I'll download this app called A Sprinkle of Jesus because uh, good morality is better than nothing. And the good stuff and the great stuff that you're trying to fill in the foundation of your home, the foundation of your life, where the cracks and the holes are, it's only ever a temporary fix. But you, know, you want to know what gives us peace? Like, we can, we can actually have peace with God. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, you, you can actually have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because you have been justified by faith. Today, I want, I want to make an argument that you can have peace with God, but the missing element is not the great stuff. Like the missing element of peace with God is actually not just reading your Bible more. The key element of having peace with God is not going to church more. It's not serving more. It's not more good works. It's not trying harder or praying longer or studying the Bible more. Like you, now this time you're going to have commentaries and you're going to go through a Bible study curriculum. That is not the key to have peace with God because you can do all those things and there will only ever be temporary fixes unless you have faith in God. I think that's the key element to having peace with God. It's faith, because everything else will be a temporary, momentary, great stuff fix that will wear down over time, because the real foundation must be faith. Today, I want to continue speaking from this idea. If you're a note taker and you like to have titles, this is my title for today's message on the other side of faith. On the other side of faith. Because I think for many of us, we've been trying this Christianity thing for a little while. We've been trying to follow Jesus, but I say I have faith in God, and I say I'm a, a Jesus follower and I'm a Christian, but I, I haven't seen what's actually on the other side. Because it's still really hard, and nothing I do seems to ever actually fix what my problem is. Like I live life not being able to step into the next because I don't know. Like you, you really don't know what the, what the key is. But I really believe that it is faith. We're going to spend the most of our time in Romans today. So you can turn your Bibles to Romans 4 verse 16. And I, I really want to accomplish two things. I want to give you a theological presentation, and then I want to encourage you. And, and don't be scared when we say a theological presentation. We're going to use words from the Bible. We're going to use some other words that people use for theological presentations, if you will. But I think it's important because once we truly understand what is happening in this thing called faith, once we understand what's happening in this thing as Christianity relating to Jesus, then we might actually be able to get to the other side of faith. So, turn to Romans 
4, verses 16. Let me set the stage here of what's happening in the book of Romans. Paul is writing to a group of people in Rome. You have the Jews and you have the Gentiles. And they're, they're, they're kind of arguing a little bit. See, the Jews were actually cast out from Rome because of, of stuff. And the Gentiles are like, okay, this is how we're going to do church uh, because the Jews are no longer here, so we don't have to fight about what we eat or how we do it. And then the Jews come back, and then they're like, hey, that's not how you can do church. You're eating the wrong things, and you, you, like, you can't do that. See, the Jews have special customs become, because they come from a heritage of Abraham. Probably you've heard of a man named Abraham. It talks about him in Genesis. But then you have the Gentiles, which are people that, that do not have a Jewish heritage, but they are calling themselves Christians. So you have two different groups of people that are all trying to follow Jesus, but one has a heritage and they have a lot of specific customs and you have a, like regular people like us, right? So this is what happens. Paul is saying, okay, you don't have to fight over what you eat. And there's actually one little thing that the Jews keep telling the Gentiles that they have to do. It's this thing called circumcision. So it's like the, the Gentiles come in, they're like, hey, I want to worship God. And the Jews are like, great. Um, hey, come here. So I don't know if you heard about this, um, but Abraham, when God came to him, it was like all good, and like he, he his faith gave him righteousness. But then uh, he got circumcised, you know, like, like he, and then the Gentiles are like, I don't, know, I don't know what you're talking about, and the Jews are like, I mean, we're gonna have to do a, like a little operation, like scissors, knife, like, we're going to heat it up. It'll be sanitary, I promise. And the Gentiles are like, ah, I don't know if I want to follow Jesus that badly. Uh, I'm not going to do the circumcision thing, but I will follow Jesus. And Paul, and you're like, why am I, why am I talking about circumcision? Like, because here, right in Romans 4, before verses 16, Paul makes the argument that Abraham had faith and it was counted to him as righteousness before the circumcision. So he's telling the Jews and the Gentiles, it's not about whether if you've been circumcised or not. It's about faith. It's about having a faith in God. And then this is what he says in verse 16. You're like, oh my gosh, finally to the Bible. Okay, Romans 4 verses 16 through 17. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, talking about Abraham, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Right, so Paul is saying here, look, it's not about a heritage that makes you right with God. He's just talking about this all the way up through Romans. It's not about a heritage. It's not about a circumcision. What it is about is sharing of the faith in God through the likeness through the person that Abraham has displayed before us, right? So we have faith in Jesus Christ, just as Abraham had faith in God. That's what makes us the collective body of Christ. Here we go, continue to go on. Romans 4, verse 18 through 25. This is a little bit of a longer portion. This is what it says about Abraham. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. Y'all need to start working out. And if you're old, you're not as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old. So and if you're before 100, you're not old. Uh, and when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. I love this. But it was for ours 
Also, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Ooh, I'm getting, I can read this passage and it just gets me excited. Now I want to look at these two verses at the end of this passage, Romans 24 and 25. It will be counted to us who believe in whom raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. I'm like, what is this word justification? Continue on to Romans 5, 1. So this is actually the next verse. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith. What is this idea of justification by faith? It's a theological term. and There are some that are closely related. So we have regeneration, justification, and sanctification. They all deal with uh, how God sees us. And maybe for modern day language, for Christians, we say this. Oh, are you saved? When, when did the Lord reveal himself to you? This is what we're talking about. So regeneration, it, it refers to what God does in us. When he opens the eyes of our soul to see and understand him in and the kingdom of God. So regeneration, he opens up your eyes. He opens up your heart to the person of Jesus. It is that revelation moment where you're like, wow. I am a sinner in need of a savior. You have been, your soul has been regenerated. But then, we then can react in faith and justification happens. So I put my faith in Jesus. It's a lot of the prayers that we pray at the end of messages, uh, a sinner's prayer, a salvation prayer, an altar call. There's a lot of different names for it. But when you put your faith in Jesus and you say, I am now yours, what is happening there? There's actually two parts to justification. But justification, I know I'm, I'm just getting technical, but I think it's really important. Justification is a, is a judicial statement, a judgment of God with respect to us. It's the legal declaration from God declaring to us that we are just, in, just and righteous in his sight. Sanctification, then, is the process of becoming more like Jesus as we live in this tension between the now and not yet. Living in the tension between the kingdom of God is here, but it's still coming. Jesus is going to come back. Living in the tension of, I'm still a human, embodied in flesh, but I have a regenerated spirit, a saved spirit. So what happens in justification? Like, what is going on? There are two sides to justification and three imputations. Jefferson, these are a lot of words. I'm going to make it real clear for you, I promise. The two sides to justification are this. The forgiveness of sins and the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. So, so what's going on here? When Jesus died on the cross, he died for the forgiveness of sins. Just every person's sin, your sin, your sin, uh, your sin, my sin, all the sins that happened, all the sins that will happen, Jesus died for the forgiveness of all of them. And then when Jesus was raised from the dead three days later, something else happens in that moment. The imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. So now Christ's righteousness, his perfection, is now laid upon those who call themselves Christians. And you're like, okay, I think I understand what you're saying, but I don't understand this idea of Jesus' perfection is now on me. What does this mean? This is where the imputation comes in. Imputation is kind of like an impartation. I think that's a, a similar word. When something is imputed into us, something like that's imparted into you. So there's three imputations. Firstly, there is an imputation of Adam's sin into humanity. So when Adam and Eve sin, 
through one man, sin entered into the world. So now all of humanity, when you are born, you are born into a sinful nature. Your flesh is sinful. It's, it's, it's kind of bad news. It's, it's not too great for all of us. So because of what Adam did, now his, his sin, it is imputed into us. So on a, on a moral ground of negative and, and, and plus, right, we are now in this kind of negative, like we are below morality, like we're not good, um, we're probably not going to get into heaven. And then when Jesus dies, we impute our sin onto Jesus. You're like, that is not fair. Uh, you're right. And it's called the good news of the gospel. That my sin, Jesus took on all the weight of sin. And you're like, but Jesus was perfect. Yes, he was. And that is how when he dies, he's able to be the last sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. So in this moment, we are now morally neutral, right? We were negative because of Adam's imputation of sin to us. So we're negative here, right? Negative. And then on this side, after Jesus dies, our sin is imputed onto Christ. So now I'm just, I'm just neutral, right? Not minus, not plus. All of my sins have been forgiven. And if it stopped there, life would be hard. And a lot of us think that life does end there. And that's why Christianity is so hard for you. It's because you keep trying harder thinking that that is what's going to make God love you more. Because you're like, okay, I understand Christ forgave me, but now I actually have to work harder for God to love me. That's why we try to fill all these voids, because we think that we are just morally neutral, so we have to achieve more. We have to get the paycheck. We have to have the status. We have to do all these things to look good, but on the other side, we're trying to look good for God too. So like I pray more, I watch church more, I listen to worship music more. And it's like, see God, I'm doing all the Christian things. Am I not better yet? But what we have failed to realize is that Jesus doesn't leave us morally neutral when he raises from the dead his righteousness, his perfection is now imputed back to us, and now we are morally in the plus signs. We are seen through the lens of Jesus Christ. So when God sees you, he doesn't see you as a sinner anymore. When God sees you, he doesn't just see you as a good guy. He doesn't just see you as a good girl. No, he sees you through the lens of Jesus Christ, which means that he sees you perfectly, that he sees you righteously. And I love the design of this because through this way, through receiving Christ's righteousness on us, it is the most righteous place that we could ever be. See, if Adam and Eve didn't sin, their whole life would have to be working at being perfect, like working at not sinning. Then if they died, then they're like, look, I'm morally good, like I'm neutral, I haven't messed up. And it's like, okay, cool. But because they sinned and Jesus comes, takes on the penalty for sin, then gives you his righteousness, imputes his righteousness on you, you are now at the same level of righteousness as Jesus. And you're like, that is bonkers crazy. I know who I am. Like, I know what I did yesterday. I know what I did three years ago. I know what I'm thinking about doing tomorrow. But this is the good news of the gospel. When I put my faith in Jesus Christ, my sins are forgiven and I am now declared righteous. It is a legal declaration of how God sees you and I. So what does that mean for us? I mean, well, what does it now, like, I put my faith in Jesus, which I, I will say this, that faith is not only believing what God and Jesus says is true. Like, I can believe things are true, but still not put my trust in it. Like, you might believe God exists and that he created the world, but you still haven't put your trust in him. 
Like you can believe that the Bible is a historical document, like the things in it are true, but like you, you don't believe in it. Faith is two parts. It is declaring and agreeing with the truth of what something is. So believing that God is who he says he is. And number two, putting your trust in him, which means believing that he will do what he says he will do. Believing that God is who he says he is and believing that he will do what he says he will do. So I put my full assurance, all my trust in the person of Jesus. And now you're saying, now what? Like, what's on the other side of all this good news, apparently? Apparently, like, it's great news. Romans 5, 18. Oh, sorry, wrong verse. Merp. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to keep reading to verse 2 all the way through 4. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. By sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is what is on the other side of faith. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is it. No condemnation no condemnation like seriously like, like 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 no condemnation like i can wake up in the morning and have joy like i can wake up in the morning and not be held back by my own thoughts of my mistakes i can wake up in the morning and have peace with god I can wake up in the morning and connect with the Holy Spirit without having to do or work harder. You mean I can wake up and God sees me through the lens of Jesus' righteousness? Like there's no condemnation? There's no condemnation. But because of this, that means I can do whatever I want, right? No. Right, it addresses this in Romans. It says, should we sin more that, may, that grace may abound? It's like, of course not. But we can and we should wake up and have a confidence in us. Not because of the things that we've done, but because of the righteousness of Jesus. Like Jefferson, isn't this a series on faith? I've heard you say the word justification. I've heard you say the word perfection. I've heard you said righteousness a lot. And you talked about faith a little bit, but I don't see where it comes into play. But I love the faith of Abraham in Romans 4, specifically in verse 21. This is what it says about Abraham. Abraham fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Abraham was convinced despite his body, his age, his circumstances, that not only that God would make him a father of many nations, which is his calling, but also convinced that God had declared him righteous, right? The legal declaration of his right standing with God. He believed God that he was justified, I think this is what we need to catch. This is the kind of faith that I want. I want an Abrahamic faith that says, I'm fully convinced that I'm in right standing with God because I've put my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm fully convinced that God is going to fulfill every single promise in my life that he has promised me. I'm fully convinced that I could wake up and I can meet the creator of the universe in my room through his written word and I can pray and he will hear me and I can pray and he will speak to me. I'm fully convinced that I have a faith in Jesus Christ, which means there is no more condemnation. 
So what is it that God called you to do that you abandoned years ago because you thought you weren't good enough? Because I want you to be fully convinced that you can start that job. I want you to be fully convinced that you can create a business out of nothing. I want you to be fully convinced that he called you to vocational ministry. I want you to be fully convinced that you can be the mom, that you can be the dad. I want you to be fully convinced that you can be the spouse that your spouse needs. I want you to be fully convinced that you are righteous in the standing of God and that you can go and do what you were supposed to do because you can become who you're supposed to become through the person of Jesus Christ. I'm fully convinced. It's not because I have a faith in myself. That's maybe probably where you got tripped up. You had half a faith that you, you, you know that God's real, but your assurance and your faith and your trust is still in yourself. It's still in the great things that you think you can fill the cracks with but the rats keep coming back. They keep chewing through the great stuff. Like, why? Why doesn't the great stuff work? It's because the foundation, the whole foundation needs to be fixed. It's a foundation that is built on faith. A faith in Jesus Christ. A faith that says, I repented and I gave my life to Jesus and I know he forgives me and I know he sees me as righteous. But in my brain, the rats keep saying that you can't get past the fact that you cheated on your spouse. And the rats in your brain are saying that you can't get past the things that your teacher said to you as a kid that you would never amount to nothing. And the rats in your brain keep telling you that you will never, ever be a whole person worthy of love. I'm trying to help you get the rats out. And I'm trying to help you replace the good stuff with the God stuff of faith. So no longer can I wake up and continue to meditate meditate on my past. I can only wake up now and be fully convinced that I am righteous because of Jesus. And because of that, I'm going to pursue everything that I can do to become who I'm supposed to become so that I can do what I'm supposed to do. I love Romans 5, 1 through 5. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Make no mistake, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel that says if you put your faith in Jesus, all your dreams will come true and that all your circumstances won't be hard. The reality is life might be a little harder. The circumstances might be a little bit worse, but your life will be better because you get to be righteous before God and the Holy Spirit that has been poured out into your heart, you can wake up convinced that God is who he says he is, and that he will do what he says he will do. Don't quit now. I know you feel like you're at the end of your rope, but this is the faith that I am trying to build, that Abrahamic faith, fully convinced, fully convinced I'm righteous before God, fully convinced that the world will be better because I put my faith in Jesus Christ, 
I'm fully convinced I can be a better husband because I put all my faith in Jesus. I'm fully convinced despite the harsh circumstances, despite the degrading teacher, despite the disapproving parent, despite my past, despite the rats that keep coming, the, despite the thoughts I can't get rid of, I am fully convinced I was made on purpose. And I'm fully convinced I was made for a purpose. And I'm fully convinced that God didn't just save me from something, but he saved me to something and he saved me for something. Don't quit now. There is so much more life on the other side of faith. Fully convinced. Fully convinced. Fully convinced. And maybe... You haven't had this faith. Maybe you might be realizing today that you, you believed God was real, but you never actually put your full faith in him. I, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. So if that's you, I want you to repeat this prayer after me and, and really truly mean it from the depths of your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I put my faith in you. I believe that you were a perfect man, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for my sins, three days later rose again, and now you give me the free gift of life and righteousness. From this day forward, I will put all of my faith in you. Lord, have your way in my life. Transform me from the inside out. I love you, Jesus. Amen. That's the most important decision you've ever made. And if that's you, I want you to reach out to us. You can, eat, you can go to our, our, our website and you can email us, highpoint.mana.church. I know you know how to navigate a website. But contact us. Let us know you made that decision because you're not supposed to do this alone. Here's the last thing I want to do. I want to take communion together. Because what communion does, it forces us to remember Jesus' sacrifice. Maybe right now you're going to get your elements. You just need something to eat and something to drink right cracker and water will do but as we we take this moment to remember what Christ done especially after me yelling at you for the past little while understanding what happens in that justification that he forgives your sins but he also gives you his righteousness but the way that happened was a brutal death and Jesus was perfect And he is innocent. But because he loves you so much, he offered his physical life. And he took on the world's sin, past, future, present. He took it all. It was a brutal death that he died. But he rose three days later. So now as you take that bread or you take something to eat. It says in the scriptures as Jesus talks to his disciple at the dinner table, he says, this is my body broken for you. Take it in remembrance of me. So you can go ahead and eat your element, your cracker, your bread. And after they had done this, he opens up his cup He lifts it up and he says, this is my blood spilt for you, shed for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. And in the breaking of the body, your sins forgiven. And in the shedding of the blood, righteousness attributed to you. May this be a holy moment in your household, 
in, in your room, in the car. Don't be, don't be eating and drinking and driving. It's dangerous. May this be a holy moment where you reflect on your life. And it is somber because we realize the pain that Jesus went through. But it is also a time of rejoicing, a time of celebration, a time to give God the glory and the honor, entering into his courts with thanksgiving and praise. Thank you, Jesus, for breaking your body and shedding your blood for me. May I continue to put my faith in you as you transform me. God, as I put my full faith in you, I am fully convinced that you have forgiven me, that you have declared me righteous, and now there is no more condemnation for my life, and I can live with courage, and I can live with joy, and ultimately, like it says in Romans 5.1, I can have peace with God through the person of Jesus Christ. Listen, I love you so much. Thank you for spending this time with us worshiping and hearing of the word and hopefully being inspired and seeing a little bit more of the picture of Jesus. Don't do this life alone. Contact us. We love to go on this journey with you. I love you so much. I can't wait to see you next week. Tomb where soldiers watch in vain was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. I got as robbed the grave. I got as robbed the Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. As we close out today, I want you to remember one thing. Growth Track starts today, a brand new cycle. And you want to know what Growth Track is? I'm so glad you asked. It is how you get connected with us here. It's how you find out who we are, what we believe, and better yet, what God has called you to. And I really believe that God has called each and every one of us for a different purpose to advance his kingdom. So you can get started in Growth Track today. All you have to do is go to our website, sign up. We'll have a leader reach out to you right away. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We love you. We hope you have a blessed week. Enjoy the game. Enjoy your family. See you later.